Most enterprises don't help the individual develop their own agenda. They just are advocating the agenda of the enterprise. Look, we got to create value and we got to do it now. I don't have time for you. And in my experience, you don't have time not to deal with them. In all my experience, the more I pour into the workforce in terms of being tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted with their development, the more I pour into that, the more they grow, the better they do, and the more we prosper. And somehow in my corporate life with KKR and other companies, we tend to be so results-oriented that we neglect that part of the process. Welcome to the podcast where we explore the uh, the art of value creation in three macro buckets, material value, emotional energy value, and spiritual value, whether it's within organizations, communities, or families. I'm your host, Lee Benson, and today we have a very special guest, Doug Conant. Doug is the only former Fortune 500 CEO who is a New York Times bestselling author, a top 50 leadership innovator, a top 100 leadership speaker, and a top 100 most influential author in the world. He is a founder and CEO of Conant Leadership and chairman of CECP. Previously, he served as president of Nabisco president and CEO of Campbell Soup Company, and chairman of Avon Products. Doug, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. Oh, it's great to finally be with you. I'm sorry I'm such a neophyte in terms of connecting you with, with you through technology, but I'm here now, so I'm excited to get started. That, that's awesome. Yeah, technology can be a challenge. So this past weekend, I read the blueprint cover to cover, and I'm likely going to read it again. I found it to be such a powerful tool with all the sets you put in there to develop a leadership foundation and how to cultivate it really for your entire leadership journey. It was just absolutely fantastic. Thank you for writing it. And I wrote down a ton of questions, which would take us three days to get through. Um, but before we get into a few of those questions, I'm really curious, um, what were the milestones in your life early on when you were a child or at any point that that kind of got you going down this road, this leadership road? Well, uh, I've always been fascinated by leadership. I grew up in a small town in Illinois and uh, the land of Lincoln. And so we were studying Abraham Lincoln in kindergarten. And uh, I was fascinated by by people like him when I was very young. And then as I as I grew older, I was interested in sports. So I started studying uh, sports stars and leaders in the sports world. And uh, and then I went on to college and I I studied. uh, uh history and economics and leaders in those fields then i went to business school and i was fascinated with with leaders in business they came seemed to come in all shapes and sizes and perspectives and uh so i was a student of all that then i went to work finally and uh i i i realized well this is not easy work you know, it's not just read a book and go do it. I got my MBA at Kellogg by the time I was 23, 24. Mm-hmm. And then I, here I go. I'm going to go lead the these companies to higher ground. And it was complicated and it was hard and it was nuanced. And so I thought, I, there's there's more to learn here. So basically, I guess I've been a student of leadership my whole life. I think, and it goes all the way back to... Uh, to Abraham Lincoln and American presidents were the were the first area I was wildly focused on in grade school, if you will. Hard to believe, but uh, that 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 piqued my interest. And then trying to walk in the shoes of these leaders, I, I realized, gosh, this is hard. You know, I can't just figure it all out and tell everybody what to do, and then it, the world's going to go on. So I. I realized people had hearts and minds of their own, and somehow I had to tap into it in a way that worked to advance the agenda of the enterprise. But in order to do that, it had to work for the individual involved. 
And so I found I had to be much more of a seeing being uh, as a leader. And hence, I've been, I'm still working on it. I'm 72 and I'm just getting warmed up. <laughs> I don't think there's any end to how we can cultivate being a better leader and, and creating more value, getting better results. One of the things you talked about in the book is um, starting where you're at going forward, because I talk to a lot of leaders and and they think it's pretty daunting. They'll never be the status of a, you know, a, you know, pick the leader, a Jack Welcher or anyone. And and you talk about starting where you're at and and what's your advice for getting, you know, getting leaders to really start moving in that direction and being OK with with where they're at and going from there? Well, you know, uh, several people have been associated with that quote, start where you are with what you have where mm -hmm. you're at. And uh, uh, I have found that, it, you know, if you look at the science of, uh, of peop people making personal change, you find uh, – James Cleary's got a great book. You've probably read it on habits, and uh, and and what he finds is small changes over time make the biggest, most sustainable differences. And so, when I'm working with somebody, we start small. We talk start talking about what Stephen Covey would call your circle of control. What do you have control over? Well, I have control over me. Okay, so let's start stay in that circle. And what can how can we start to uh, evolve the leadership profile in a way that works for you? And uh, so, in my experience, the the mindset you, one has to have, the growth mindset one has to have, is one that's built on things you know very well. You know, this is six sigma. This is continuous improvement 101. It's let's start making some thoughtful changes and doing them in a way that are repeatable. And uh, so when I'm working with leaders, we start with where they are. The next thing we do is we do a deep dive on where they've been. And uh, because what tends to happen, and I know you've been through this because of all the work you've done in the in the corporate world. Uh, let me step back. Uh, when I'm doing, I was just doing a talk in Arizona day before yesterday, and or uh, whatever day I don't even know what day it is uh, recently, and uh, and I I had the audience at the very beginning imagine. I said, who who in your lifetime has made the most pr profound impact on you? And they all think about it. And then they all, uh, and then I, I have them talk with each other about it for a few minutes. And to a person, it's virtually always a family member or a near family member. And I guarantee you, for the most part, they didn't go get their MBA. And I guarantee you that they don't work against 13 competencies that you have to get better at. Mm -hmm. And but these people had the most profound influence on them. And I say, well, how did they do that? Were they trained? Not really. No. And we end up to at a place where we just where we identify, well, they had high standards for me. To a person, this person expected a lot of me, and they cared about me. Tough-minded on standards, tender-hearted with how they worked with me. No compromise on performance, but they loved me. And when we start looking at it, and we have them basically say, "Okay, here's where we can start. Let's let's look at." this tapestry of experience you have with people like that who've had a profound influence on you in your life. And let's draw some conclusions about what works for you based on your own experience, because you know what great leadership looks like. You just told me about the people that were had the most profound impact on you. 
And so we start there and we have them look at their own life. And uh, they amazing. It's amazing to me. They uncover all these insights into what works for them that have been lost while they're trying to address the 13 competencies that are listed in the performance review. Mm. All the, the companies, your companies, my companies, we were telling them, here are the 13 things you need to do if you want to be effective here. And I'll tell you what the most important is. Well, I'll tell you the number. Mm. Okay. Well, that's important to us, but it's not what makes them tick. And they tend to put all that human experience they had, which is really what motivates them, in the parking lot while they're trying to make me happy as a CEO, showing that they're addressing their 13 competencies on quality of judgment, analytical rigor, communication skills, all this mumbo jumbo. Not that that's not important, but first I find that you have to be anchored in who you are and what works for you, and then you can take on the challenge of meeting the needs of the enterprise. Most enterprises don't look, help the individual develop their own agenda. They just are advocating the agenda of the enterprise. Look, we got to create value and we got to do it now. I don't have time for, for you. And in my experience, uh, you don't have time not to deal with them. In all my experience, the more I pour into the workforce, in terms of being tough-minded on standards and tender-hearted with their development, the more I pour into that, the more they grow, the better they do, and the more we prosper. And somehow in the in my corporate life with KKR and other companies, mm. we tend to be so results-oriented that we neglect that part of the process. Yeah, th this is super fascinating to me and how how we translate our alignment tools out through the organization, whether it's 100 employees or 50,000 or more employees, a mission, a vision, a set of behaviors, whatever it is. I remember a while ago when I had my uh, larger aerospace company, I was interviewing for a head of um, revenue generation. And this is an individual that actually worked at Honeywell. And I'm at dinner and he's going on about how our 12 values are, are um, the thing that makes us so wildly successful. He never, he, did, he didn't name one. He was just talking about it. So that's, that's interesting. I'm, I tell me what these values are and how you're actually using them. And he couldn't name one of them. And I thought that was just incredibly telling. So I, I think kind of to your point, in, in most organizations, team members are doing what they think they're supposed to do to make maybe their leader happy, follow the rules, whatever it is, rather than coming in with a mindset of, I need to come in and create value every day, It's which is way better than coming to work every day and saying, I'm here to solve problems or do what I'm supposed to do. I'm here to create value. Yeah, you and and I, I, I subscribe to that, but I think that's incomplete to my way of thinking. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's not all about the enterprise. It's about them too. I need to feel good about creating value. You know, Stephen Covey had a great, a simple model for me, uh, which was basically Maslow's hierarchy, except he put it in simpler terms. He said, look, there, there, there are four levels here. And the Gallup organization, which does employee engagement, the Q12 survey and others, mm -hmm. uses the same basic model. But basically he said, you know, there, there are four things that you got to be hitting on. You, they have to have good living, working conditions. They have to feel valued. They have to have opportunities to learn and grow. And they have to feel as if their role is special somehow. Because they're either working or thinking about doing work more than anything else they do, including tending to their families. And they're and and if it's not special, if it's not intrinsically meaningful to them, they can't sustain the effort or they won't. You know, if the conditions aren't right, if they don't feel valued, if they can't learn and grow, and if they don't feel as if it's special, not special for the enterprise, special for them. And and we we seem to have overlooked the individual. They're just a per a, a cog in a wheel. Not true. I just don't buy it. The uh, the key to me is I think about it. Think of our old Venn diagrams in school. You know, we've got the or enterprise agenda. 
right? But then we have the individual agenda. And hopefully there's this wonderful crosshatch theory in the middle where the individual is able to have self-actualization and support the enterprise in a meaningful way. Too much of leadership these days is focused exclusively on the enterprise and then how we can manipulate the individual to deliver against the enterprise agenda. I don't mean manipulate in a bad way, but it's somehow we're going to influence their behavior. And that will work for a little while, could work, but ultimately they have to own their behavior. And they have to, and it has to feel good to them. They have to want to give you that disposable time at from eight to ten at night, going through the emails or double checking the analysis, you know? And yeah. and from my perspective, enterprises, the companies I worked for, which were great companies, were two one way. They weren't dialing into the individual. And I I'll get off my soapbox in a minute. Uh, <laughs> but but if if you think about the leaders, the 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 next generation of leaders, they're all saying, "What about me?" They're not saying, "What about the enterprise?" And how how am I going to plug in and help you hit your numbers? They're saying, "What about me?" And the 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 companies I'm seeing coming out of COVID are companies that are saying, "Okay, what about you? How can we help you realize?" your ambitions and connect that to the work we need to do. And where I started, where I had my whole career, I mean, I I started at the lowest entry level of General Mills a thousand years ago, 40, uh, for over 45 years ago. You know, it's day one, here's the performance review, here are the 13 things you need to do. And here's your desk, and here's your manager, and get to work. And, uh, you know, it's two one way. And in my opinion, uh, it, it it's going to be hard to build a an enduring success story with the same workforce. You can churn through it. Goldman Sachs is a great example. Goldman Sachs is designed for up or out. Okay? Yeah. Uh, and so and, and and they'll do it for a while. And then they'll say, this isn't for this isn't about me. This is about Goldman Sachs. I'm going to go to do something else that's about me. But they're built. They have a system built, uh, predicated on turnover. Uh, but the companies I've been associated with are companies that are very dependent on some modest degree of tenure. And uh, where people actually know how to get things done. And uh, and have that inventory of experience that's essential to running a, a manufacturing company, and uh, so I, I think we've got to rethink the model. I I love your notion of emotionally and spiritually getting alignment because I think that's the place where we've fallen short. Yeah, I, we're really we're really good at at metrics. I mean. And and we could be better. Most companies could be better. But where they're falling down, in my opinion, is not necessarily on the metrics. It's on getting the people to buy into the agenda and execute against the metrics. Yeah, 100% agree. And that's why I think about value creation holistically. So we mm -hmm. have the numbers. We have the results we're going for that way. We have the emotional energy piece of it, which drives the intrinsic motivation. And, and one of the definitions of being a leader in an organization that I use with lots of clients and I've used in all seven companies that I've started is that leaders get results and they foster an environment where every team member is intrinsically motivated and empowered to create more value over time. And ideally, I want them all being the CEO of their own role. And so when people say all you care about is money and no, it's... Mm -hmm holistic so it's the emotional yeah. energy on the spiritual side it can just be connectedness to the team it could be pure love i love the way you talk about that in your book so that's mm -hmm. the that's sort of the the bigger more complete version of, of value creation and it's for all stakeholders especially the team members if they're all the ceo of their own roles and driving it themselves 
um, I, I I think that's the ideal situation, but also customers, shareholders, investors, you know, everything else that goes into that. How do you create that culture? And and let me let me set this up a little bit. I I okay. work with companies that are from startup, small, midsize, um, some of the larger ones, fifty billion dollar plus market caps, and. I'll ask, you know, so what do you do for leadership development? And and they have leadership development programs. They send them to offsites, uh, courses, et cetera. And I said, great. Well, how do the, what do the leaders think about those? And they say, well, they're, they think they're fantastic. Well, how do you know? Well, because we get surveys back. Well, is there any connection to the leadership development that you're doing and what you're spending on that time and other resources to moving the metrics? And yeah. 100% of the time, they say they don't have anything. And Jack Welch and I used to talk about this. And, mm-hmm. and he said, and I agree, 90% of leadership development dollars are wasted. What what do you, how, what's your advice around that? How do you, because you, you're you, like, it sounds to me like you really got on the front lines and, and moved the needle here. How do you do it right versus cookie cutter approach that most people go after? Well, first of all, I would tell you, I think it's the CEO's job, not the uh, CHRO's job. Mm -hmm. I think the CEO has to be the uh, chief uh, people person. I think you have to own the talent, have the mental model of how you're going to attract, engage, develop, leverage, and retain the talent. And... uh, Obviously, you have a bigger job, so you have the CHRO has to be your partner in crime, uh, carrying the flame for you when you're doing other jobs. But uh, I think uh, it has to be, in my opinion, the number one imperative for the enterprise. You know, I think about all the teams I've been on where we've had the talent. God, it was fun. The job was so easy. You know? And we could do amazing things. And then on other places where we were struggling with with talent gaps, God, it was a nightmare. Mm. And uh, so, uh, and then, and I'm sure you realize this when you, as a CEO in your multiple companies, I realized when I became uh, CEO of Campbell, which was an old economy canned soup company, let's, it was being compared to a buggy whip. All right. We'd lost half our market value in a year. Uh, We were headquartered in the poorest, most dangerous city in the United States, Camden, New Jersey. We were we had operations in 38 countries. So we had all kinds of complexity. And uh, uh, and. I realized when I'm sitting in my corner office that of the thousand decisions made every hour in that company, I was out of the room for 999 of them. I was totally dependent on the workforce, totally dependent on the workforce. And I quickly learned that even if there was a decision I should have known about, by the time I would hear about it, it would be repackaged like so it made sense, even if it didn't. You know, you quickly realize, well, I can help guide the ship i can we can nail the strategies there are all kinds of things we do do as ceos but ultimately we are totally dependent on the workforce to get it done and they have to be able to today when i when jack was running ge i i too knew jack and uh we were in a hierarchical militaristic kind of world Where if you didn't know how to do something, you go talk to your boss about how do I get it done? Now, these poor people that are working on these in these crumbled uh, hierarchies and with that are flattened and have way too many direct reports. Your manager doesn't know how to do it. (laughs) You got to figure it out on your own. You're on your own. And it's the Wild West with all the churn that's going on right now. And so your anxiety is going to be at an all-time high as a contributor with all the churn and the risk and everything else. And the enterprise's ability to actually help you do your job is slim and none. Mm. Uh, And so what do you have to – how do you persevere through that? I believe you have to fundamentally believe 
the company has your back. And that, you know, even if you can't make this decision, we got your back and we're going to find our way through this. There's got to be a new level of trust. There's an imperative of trust that was a nice to have before when everything was clear and you you had your KPIs and it, uh, the world was simpler. But now it's, you know, it's, what do they say? A VUCA world? Volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. And now it's a Bonnie world. New, uh, new culture. Every generation needs a new word. So the new generation has Bonnie, B-A-N-I, brittle, anxious, nonlinear, incomprehensible, which is basically a VUCA world on steroids. And in that environment, there's this premium on building a, a trusting relationship with employees that says, I do care about you. And I've got to manifest that in new ways today, not in the old ways. And it's got to be around probably your learning and development because the world is changing faster. I have to help you learn and grow or we fail. So there's something about uh, making extraordinary commitments to learn, learning and growth and building trusting relationships that when I started were nice to have. If you want a really good talent, because mm-hmm. good talent would persevere through it. But if you want a top-notch talent, now if you want any talent, you got to have that. It, it, at least that's my perspective. The game's changed. The it, game's it, changed. Yeah, it, it really has. One of the questions that I like to ask um, a leader in any organization is, how do you create value for the for the company, the nonprofit, for-profit, whatever it is? Yeah. And typically I get a job description. I don't, I don't get something that's really concrete. And I think that that adds to the problem. And I'm, I'm really big on an intentional operating methodology to create value faster and faster. And that Mm -hmm. every team clearly understands what that is. Uh, because without that, you, you need a whole army of stars to make it work. And that's a pretty small percentage of the population. It's, you, you, Mm -hmm. you can't do that. Um, so what, what are your thoughts around an, an intentional way of creating value that every single team um, can can align with? And, and then it you know gets a much, in my opinion, a much higher percentage of folks to perform, you know, solid yeah. performers or even like stars. But what, what about an intentional operating methodology that permeates the entire organization? Is that reasonable in your view? I think it is, but I think it's like I I think it's incomplete for today because what I think is missing is there's not an int- which is why I wrote the blueprint. Yeah, is there's not an intentional operating methodology for the individual. Uh, they're mm-hmm. trying to plug into the enterprise operating methodology, but they don't have their own, and and in order to weather the storm and all the uncertainty and the anxiety, they got to be really well anchored in how they want to show up before and then figure out how do I plug in to the operating methodology of the enterprise. And what I'm discovering is very few people are prepared to plug in. Uh, From what I know about you, you were ready to go. You were ready to be plugged in. You were really well anchored on what you thought and you believed, and I'm sure you're more anchored now than you were then. But, but uh, if you, if you've got the, you know, what what are they talking the other day? I was saying, you know, uh, somebody asked me about courage today. Courage, yeah. and and how do you how do you have courage? And I, I I found myself saying to them, well. You know, clearly you have to have the courage of your convictions. But what I'm seeing today is that most people don't know what their convictions are. And so then they try to plug into your agenda and they can't sustain that because it's not part of their agenda. And uh, so to agree with you, I believe an operating methodology uh, for the enterprise is essential. I think people have to know what matters most in the enterprise and how it's supposed to be dealt with. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day, uh, 
Bill McNabb, who was the CEO, I guess he's still the chairman of Vanguard. And uh, uh, I did some work with him years ago when I was C right after I retired as CEO of Campbell. And he was taking over as CEO of Vanguard and shot the lights out. Uh, and he was trying to get his arms around how do I create, a, how do I go next level with Vanguard? Mm. He had Jim Collins and me talking to his leadership team. The theoretical approach and the what do you do on Monday uh, approach. He came away from that and created a model for himself that everybody in uh, in Vanguard knew about. It was all about becoming world class. He had four numbers, four things. Everybody knew it. The first one was, in his language, was an employee engagement ratio. Uh, world class was 12 to 1. He wanted to be 17 to 1. Mm. It was aspirational. And there were, and, but employee engagement was job one. Then performance was a byproduct of that sort of. He wanted 90% of all of his funds over 10 years to out, to be outperforming the competition. 90% of our funds. And then he had a net promoter score that he wanted for all clients to be 80% or better. And then he had an expense goal of cutting expenses in half by one, you know, it was, it was going from 0.2 basis points to 0.1 basis point. Mm -hmm. His whole, it was packaged beautifully in four things. Everybody got it. And on, everybody was sort of on the same page. And they knew their role in delivering against those four things. Everybody knew their role. And to me, it was uh, in, a, in his system that he was operating in, it really created great clarity without being so cumbersome that people felt uh, overwhelmed by it. And he created great value. So I can see the value to doing something like that. And uh, we tried, the, we, we had the similar experience at Campbell where we were, I was over the top maniacal about employee engagement hmm. because I could not see how an old economy canned soup company in Camden, New Jersey could be creating world-class value with the workforce we had. It just it just wasn't going to happen. Yeah. And uh, so that was what I was maniacal on. And as part of that process, we turned over 300 of our top 350 leaders. You probably read that in the book. I did. Incredible. And uh, I mean, that's six out of seven. I don't know another major Fortune 500 company that's turned over six out of seven leaders in three years. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, you know. We attracted some world-class leaders to our organization mm. uh, as we focused on leaving a legacy, learning, loving, giving them the right working conditions. Uh, I couldn't pay them a lot, but uh, we tried to be clear with our operating system. And, and, and we, there was a pinch of Don Quixote in there where we were tilting at windmills trying to create more value. But uh, there, we had a lot of leaders that drank the Kool-Aid. I'll tell you, I was very gratified. This week, Forbes uh, uh, published, or maybe it was last week, uh, in the Fortune 500, the companies that created the most CEOs, the top 25 in the Fortune 500. Hmm. And I'm telling you, when I started at Campbell, which would have been 22 years ago, we would have been lucky to be between uh, above 500, given where we were, where we had been for quite a while. We are now in the top 10 of all Fortune 500 companies 20 years later mm. at creating CEOs from an old economy canned soup company, uh, and we're the number one food company. 
uh, I was just uh, trading uh, emails with uh, my old friend Bob McDonald, who was uh, chairman CEO of Procter and Gamble. And they were always in the top ten of this thing, and uh, he's he's like two places ahead of me. And I I told him he better look out because we're coming for him. <laughs> but uh, you know, I believe the place to lean into is in the emotional and spiritual relationship we have with employees. That's where the leverage is. We got to be disciplined on how we execute. Not saying that, but to me, the greatest point of leverage, I always felt I could get two more points of growth, two better points of return if I connected one level deeper with those employees. And, you know, for 45 years, it worked. Now, we didn't shoot the lights out. We weren't we, you know, I was dealing in an industry that was three yards on a cloud of dust. Uh, and so it was a mature sector, consumer sure. products, large companies. But uh, I, I found that if, if, if you leaned into the human element while you always focused on having a disciplined system, you won. And the, the places that were looking for the quick buck that were focused exclusively on the on the outcome and not on the process were they could have a good year but they could did not have a sustainable proposition so uh, yeah, i don't I think, know anyway yeah, that's a my couple thought. Of, yeah a couple of that's uh, that's excellent stuff the the uh a couple of things that jump out one is engagement I always ask the question, engage with what? Uh, because a lot of surveys come back where they just ask team members, are you engaged? Oh, yes. Okay, well, you we have a high engagement. Engage with I, what? Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, it's engaged with value creation. So talk more about that. Just go a little bit deeper. Um, it, everything you did worked. I mean, the results were fantastic. So you got the right engagement, whereas most larger companies, they have a survey and check a box and move forward. How did you do it differently to really get it right? Well. Uh, I, the, the tool I used was the Gallup Q12 survey, which for a time, there are now other surveys that are a lot less expensive that you can use. I, I, I used the Cadillac, uh, the Q12 survey and they had 12 questions and, uh, and they were all around living, loving, learning, leaving a legacy, my language, not theirs. And uh, and uh, what was different about what we did, we I did it with a uh, continuous improvement mindset. We did it every year. And uh, it was expensive, but we did it every year. And we had it broken down so we could get results in total or for over 600 different work groups. And uh, we added a couple questions to the survey, which the survey was really focused on the individual and how they were and whether they were uh, being productive at work. Mm. And uh, uh, we we had them. Uh, we added two questions. How helpful has your manager been in helping you address the issues? And as soon as we started surveying and asking how the manager was doing, it was amazing how much better the manager did. Uh, and uh, and then every as a result of every survey, we had a process where we get the survey results. We shared them. I actually published them for the last five years in my annual reports because I said it was the secret sauce for us winning. Uh, given everything else, given all our other assets. Uh, and uh, and out of that, every work group picked three things they were going to work on that year to improve the systems and process they had at work. Okay. Three things. And, and then we would ask them a year, how did you do on the three systems or processes you upgraded in the workplace, how helpful was your manager in bringing this to life? And over a decade, each work group addressed 30 different things. And guess what? 
their systems and processes got better. There was a continuous improvement, commitment to improvement that had transparency and visibility that managers felt accountable for. Uh, and I found that as long as we didn't overwhelm them with, we're going to do 87 things this year to improve processes, they had to be things that they could complete within the year. And some were low fruit, but you couldn't do low fruit for a decade. You had to get to the high fruit. And we addressed some of the high fruit issues at divisional and corporate levels. Uh, but I found you needed a very disciplined process in place uh, where clearly managers felt at risk. We turned over 300 out of 350 who were who, who didn't subscribe to the program. So we had to get the right people on the bus, no doubt about it. But uh, I think and I think the reason that worked was we gave them three years. You don't usually get three years to get on the bus. Uh, you know, that's but and the reason I gave them three years was, in my experience as a corporate leader, if you're lucky, you got three years. The first year, it's the other guy's fault. Look, I'm doing the best I could. What do you want me to do? Look at the mess I've got. <laughs> the, the second year, it's, well, we're, we're, we're getting some green shoots. We're starting to see where we have traction. We're, we're going to make some adjustments, but we're on the road. The third year, you own it. <laughs> and, uh, and that's uh, sort of the mindset we had at Campbell and the mindset we had as part of KKR at Nabisco for the decade before. Where you know we're going to have to own this, but we've got to take a thoughtful, disciplined approach to uh, that's real clear uh, that makes people feel accountable for uh, improving the engagement as defined by these twelve things, and uh, and then the survey itself was helpful but insufficient because it was just data. And so the key was to force the groups to pick three things to work on. And by the way, they had to review the results with everybody in their group. It wasn't a statistical sample. It was everybody in your 600 work groups or your division. Everybody had to have transparency into it. Everybody had to feel as if they were a part of it. Everybody had to know what the three things we've got to do this year to get our systems, kick them up a notch. And by the way, we know next, the following year, we're going to have to do three more things. So it was a continuous improvement mindset. I found that being maniacal about that and being disciplined uh, about it was essential. I'll, I'll tell one other thing. Uh, I also hit, we also had to reimagine our corporate expectations in terms of our purpose, our values, in terms of alignment, and our, our leadership expectations. So we created a Campbell leadership model that applied to everybody and that was in harmony with what we were serving. And the number one expectation of our leaders was you had to inspire trust. Uh, it wasn't results. It was inspire trust. The sixth expectation of our six item wheel was produce extraordinary results. So it was results oriented, but there was a process you had to go through to get it, which was all about earning the trust of the people in the company, which at the beginning was non-existent. Uh, so you had to create a an operating system for your culture around mission, vision, values, leadership expectations. Then you had to have a system to bring that to life in a tangible, real way where people could see the impact of what they were working on in their facility and in their performance. My, my biggest piece take of cake. Oh, it's so easy to say, just <laughs> <laughs> always hard to do. But my, my biggest takeaway here around the engagement is that uh, it's the follow up and follow through and you never let it go where 
in most cases, it's just data. They check the box because this is something that companies do, whereas you went all the way through. And um, I believe that everything an organization does should be done at least with the intent of making it measurably better. And culture and all that should be the same. And and you did yeah. this with culture. That that's pretty incredible. Most most get culture completely wrong. Well, you you sir. And I think as the CEO, you know what I'm talking about. You've got to be the change you want to see in the organization. You know, it, you've got to pull a Gandhi here. Uh, you have to be the change. And uh, and it's not just a survey that the HR department issues and that you share with the board once a year, if you ever share it at all. You know, it can't it has to be a living, breathing thing. And uh, and the, and it has, in my opinion, it has to be CEO led. I I I admire Jack so much for creating Crotonville. You know that was Jack's thing. He uh, for for uh, GE. I mean, and, and it, it's a place, and it had to get better. And my old professor at Kellogg, Ram Sharan, was his partner in crime when they did that. It, it had to be modeled from the top down, and uh, uh, and I think a, a leader or a group leader has to do that with their group. And you got to be relentless, you know. Uh, I remember when uh, Jim Collins, uh, I, I did a fair amount of work with him over the years, and Jim, when he did his level five leader work, uh found two distinctive characteristics about level five leaders, the ones that had taken their companies for, to being good to great over two decades, uh, which is was sort of the model I was on with an old established old economy food company. Mm. Um, uh, and he found the two distinguishing character. First of all, he was shocked. He did never heard of any of the people that actually rose to the, top he did he didn't he didn't know any of these leaders uh that were running these companies he was shocked he said i got to do some work on this and 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 then as he did the work he found two distinctive characteristics in a level five leader based on good to great one was humility it's like i don't know all the answers but the other one was perseverance and he, he 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 used he used another set of words. He said, "Fierce resolve. They never let it go. <laughs> they never let it go." And I was a dog on a bone on this talent thing. I never let it go. And every time somebody talked to me about it, <laughs> I was prepared to engage. And we were constantly we had an innovation rhythm with our talent management and our commitment to culture that was second to none. And uh, it, I think you have to be a dog on a bone with it. I think it has to be top down. I'm sure in your most successful companies, you got this core team that all drank the Kool-Aid and you were beating the drum seven days a week, uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, against an agenda, fierce resolve, and uh, and to do this in today's environment, it's hard to stay have fierce resolve around strategy or tactics because they're all changing. It feels like every leader today is rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Mm. My experience is there's only the only common element here is fierce resolve around people. About 15 years, 20 years ago, McKinsey did an article. Uh, it was on, the, the article was, there's no true competitive advantage. And then they asserted, there is, well, there is one. And the, the competitive advantage was organization agility. It was the ability to move faster, better, and more completely to address issues than the other guy, basically. And uh, and that was all about people. And having people that had the capacity to compete in a world that was constantly changing. So what I talk about when I talk with leaders now, 
every week is about have, building that capacity in their enterprise. It's all about the people. Yeah, I don't know a company that isn't having to reimagine their strategies and tactics uh, because of the tumultuousness of the marketplace. Yeah, it's uh, definitely a challenging time right now. Oh, um, gosh. Oh. And and we have such a deficit of quality leadership out there. So we need the work that you're doing really now more than ever. I I, I do have um, a question for you because everything I've done, I've, I've on my seventh company, I've started from scratch. Um, I've kept all of them private. I've been um, from an ownership and and just decision making um, in complete control of those entities, a different path than, than what you've done. Uh, the biggest one I sold to Textron um, in 2016, we had 64 leaders There's just over 500 uh, team members. And at, at the end, I was spending probably 70% of my time developing leaders. I mean, that was all I did. And that's what got us an incredible nine-figure exit, you know, for what we were doing along those lines. And when I when I look at larger companies and and the biggest one I'm working with right now to help them implement strategy, their market cap's about $60 billion. Um, the the functions seem to set up self-serving silos and aren't connected to total enterprise value creation. And is there some human nature thing that goes on there that causes that to happen? Because I see that more than I see all the functions connected that really focus on creating total enterprise value. What are your thoughts? Yeah. On well, uh, I have thoughts on it. I want to share with you a quote going back to something you said a minute ago, and I, which I agree with. We, there's a dearth of good leaders uh, when we need leadership the most. So I agree with you. And uh, one of my friends, Stephen M. R. Covey, has been quoted as saying, "The world is overmanaged and underled," and uh, and that's the way I feel. Uh, I'm not saying it's well managed, but it's overmanaged. Uh, against questionable agendas. But um, uh, yeah, uh, I think the enterprise, these companies have to have a compelling, the language now is purpose. They have to have a compelling purpose that transcends the agenda of the function or the, or the division. Uh, I'll use a bad example, but it's an example I can speak to. When, when I was at Campbell, uh, we were 38 countries. We were the world's largest soup company. We were also the world's largest vegetable juice company. We were also the third largest baked snack company in the world. So we, we weren't just soup, but uh, uh, we were in 38 countries. And, uh, you know, I had a fr I had the French, I had the Mexicans, the Canadians, you know, and there were probably 500, there were 500 or a thousand of our teammates in each one of those companies. So the complexity was off the charts. And uh, what we found we needed to do was to develop, at the time we call it a mission, a compelling mission that uh, sort of said that brought us all together, then you have to operationalize it. But uh, the the one we landed on, because we were a food company and we had certain credentials to claim this, we, we wanted to nourish people's lives everywhere, every day. Mm -hmm. And we were the nourishing food company. Everyone had a story of Campbell's Soup on a cold winter day when they went home and had their grilled cheese sandwich, okay? Or in other companies, it was other soups. But soup sort of was this base nourishing thing. We could sort of uniquely own it. And that we created that. Yeah, that's fine. But then you had to say, okay, every day in every function, you're going to run into an issue that you don't know what to do with. Because the things that come up to our manager level are things that couldn't be dealt with below them. So they're going to... There are going to be issues every day. And we said, uh, so our mission, or now I would call it purpose, should be your default positioning with everything you do. 
If you're not sure what to do, you nourish that investor. If you're not sure what to do, you nourish that consumer, you nourish that customer. And then you figure it out. But your job is to nourish. And then you ask every function and every division to talk about, and every country to talk about, okay, what's your blueprint for laddering up and getting tethered to our overall purpose? How are you nourishing Mm. in France? Germany, Belgium, Canada, Mexico, China, Russia. How are you all connecting to it? And uh, we had to create this sense of higher ambition for the company that uh, was meaningful to our employees. But then we had to challenge them to think about how you're going to operate against that higher order benefit. And then how are you going to connect your functional agenda to support it? Hmm. Uh, Because most companies, especially functions, get trapped in their own functional agenda. And we had to find a way to break the log jam, break through. So we said, well, that's fine. That's what you need to do to manage your function day to day. But there's a higher calling here. And you need to be part of it. And so we we went to the purpose, the mission, but then we developed a process that drove it down into the functions, into the countries, into the divisions. And we challenged them to operationalize it. It works if you create a higher calling. If you're just trying to get them to change what they're doing, hmm. that isn't very sexy or exciting. But if I gave permission to my leaders to be talking about how are you going to how are you going to stand up in front of the board and talk about how R and D is nourishing our consumers or the global supply chain leader? How are you going to stand up in front of my board, our board, and talk about how the global supply chain is nourishing? What are you doing to operationalize that in the plant? How are you doing that? Uh, And by the way, are you nourishing the employees through our culture building efforts? So I encourage companies, especially large companies with a lot of complexity, who want to be the change. You know, I I say it has to be top down. I think you start at the top. I'm sorry, I'm waving my arms around. You can't see completely, but you see me waving. Anyway, you start at the top with a compelling thought. And then you drive it down into the organization and challenge the organization to plug into it. And you can have your group co-create it at the top. In fact, you probably need to. But it needs to be sexy and exciting. I mean, I found if it's just, you know, if, if I was just dealing with my investors, sexy and exciting would be total share on returns better than the peer group you know, by some amount, right? But if I want to make it sexy and and exciting across the enterprise, it's something else. It's got to be at a higher order, nourishing. And there may be an investor relations. We're going to talk about how we're nourishing our investors by by outperforming the peer group in terms of total share and returns on an average three-year rolling basis or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, I really like how you're connecting all of that and sort of forcing the the value creation to connect to the greater purpose, if you will, at the top. And it just doesn't, I think, allow them to stay in silos. It forces them out of that to cross-functionally collaborate, uh, contribute to total enterprise value, the purpose. Again, back to total value creation, material, emotional energy, and spiritual. I think I think it all has to go in there. And I think everybody plays in all three buckets. Well, I, and I do think, you know, the old model was uh, when I started was uh, the CEO and the executive team figured out the strategy and then everybody went and executed it. You know, that's I'm oversimplifying, obviously. Yeah. But uh, today it really doesn't work that way. Uh, it won't work that way. with I I don't think and unless you're in a unique, smaller enterprise that's got a very specific focus. Uh, uh, you know, if you if you're in a large enterprise, 
or even a medium enterprise. It's got to be top down. It's got to have an element that's aspirational and a higher calling. It has to transcend the ordinary. And it probably has to not just speak to the financial returns, but to societal returns Mm -hmm. or stakeholder returns. And then part of that is shareholder returns. Uh, but it, and it has to be led top down in a, uh, it's not going to happen bottom up because the functions and the divisions are going to just do what they always wanted to do anyway. So it does take real leadership and who's ever working with you is lucky to have you helping. Well, thank you for that. And, and Doug, if people want to learn more about what you're doing, um, how can they find you? Uh, just go to conantleadership.com. Uh, I don't get paid for any of this. I, 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 I charge for a few things to just cover our cost, but I don't take a salary. I'm just trying to help build a better world. And uh, I have points of view, which you can obviously tell. And uh, so we're just here to help. And if they go to conantleadership.com, they'll they'll find they'll find out they'll learn more than they ever wanted to learn about what we do. Yeah, that's fantastic. We, as we talked about, we need capable leadership today more than ever. It seems like leadership on average is getting less capable and even potentially less moral. So thank you so much for what you're doing. Well, and uh, and thank you. You're out there doing the same kind of work trying to lift the leadership profile and we you know i believe the people we're working with the young next generation leaders they have an appetite to do this the right way they just need help and uh and they they have things i'm learning from them too it's not just me sharing my wisdom with them i although i i do believe i have something to share but i'm learning from them as well but they have an appetite for this we just have to help them and uh, and learn from them, too. I, I agree. I work a lot with organizations in my latest book, which is Value Creation Kid. It's about operationalizing value creation within families, and it's in all three buckets. And I'm yeah. finding the, the language is resonating with really young kids. Yeah, I, I bet it is. I bet it is. I'll have to, I haven't seen that one. I'm going to have to go to I got to do a little more homework on you. I did some, but I got to do more. I'll, uh, I'll send you the link. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so right. much for listening. And uh, I'm Lee Benson, the host. And if you can, please rate and uh, leave a review for this podcast. And until next, uh, next time, uh, go forth and create value.